Good afternoon from Patagonia. <laughs> Good afternoon. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. So I think we get started now. So very warm welcome to our very first online alumni travel talk. Absolutely delighted to see you all here. My name is Kate Suarez and I look after the travel programme at the University of Oxford. Unfortunately, I'm not sat in Oxford at the moment, but I send my Oxford greetings to you. I'm also joined in the virtual background by Claire Baxter, who looks after the travel programme at the University of Cambridge. So we're absolutely delighted to see so many of you tune in this afternoon. And please, if this is something you're really interested in, these virtual sessions, let us know your feedback and we will look at organising some more. If you have any general queries, questions about the alumni <coughs> travel programme during the session, then please make use of the chat function at the bottom of your screen. So if you kind of look at the bottom middle bit, you will see a chat button. And um, Claire and I will be delighted to answer any questions you may have about the alumni travel programme. You also see on the um, slide in front of you our contact details. And if you do want to see an overview of all the trips we're running in 2021, please visit our websites for more information. So firstly, a huge thank you to Professor Nick Davies for joining us this afternoon and leading us on this virtual travel experience extravaganza oh, from yeah. our armchairs. Yes. And also a big thank you to Ed Payne at Last Frontiers who is hosting this session today. If you haven't come across Ed before, Ed is the Managing <laughs> Director of Last Frontiers, a specialist tour operator for tailor-made travel to Latin America. Ed himself is an alumnus of Oxford and has been at the helm of Last Frontiers Oops, for the uh, last 29 uh, years. Just around the screen doing nothing. But Over the past few years, um, Ed has run a series yeah. of um, um, bottom corner. You should just look at the so We've got a little bit of background screen. noise here. Um, and you can still hear me. Um, Over the, lost my voice um, over the past few years, Ed has organised a series of alumni travel trips for us to Peru, Colombia and Chile, and they've <laughs> all been very successful. So over to you, Ed. Thank you, Kate. That's, um, that was a great intro. In fact, you said pretty much all I was going to say, so <laughs> I'll keep it brief. <laughs> I am Ed Payne. <laughs> I do run Last Frontiers. And we do do tailor-made uh, trips to Latin America and, and the alumni tours. Um, now, I thought, uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping right at the beginning. Uh, please do keep yourself muted. We've turned your videos off um, just because there are so many of you. It's fantastic. Um, several hundred, I think. Um, so uh, unless you're asked to turn your video on, please keep it off. Um, if you'd like to ask a question at any time, please just pop it in the chat and one of us will have a look at it. And uh, indeed, after Nick's uh, talk, I will uh, ask him uh, the questions that come from there. And I've got a little list that some of you really kindly asked beforehand as well. Um, and just a little tip, you can actually save the chat if it becomes really interesting. Uh, at the end of the meeting, um, there are three little dots down there and it lets you save it on your own computer. Um, so um, I just thought I'd really quickly, for those of you who aren't Last Frontiers clients, and I know some of you are on the, on the call today, uh, we do do a lovely um, guidebook, really, I call it, to Latin America. And uh, if anyone would like one after this, I put the email address, just, just send us an email and we'll send it uh, to you wherever you are in the world. And I think uh, today we have people from, from quite a wide range of countries. Um, so on the alumni uh, tour side of things, we've actually, uh, <laughs> in the uh, same as many tour operators now, we're getting more and more uh, tours building up for 2021. So <laughs> we have four, in fact, of which you can see three in front of you there. We've got a botanical one with Stephen Harris from Oxford, who's the curator at, uh, at the Botanic Gardens there uh, in uh, August next year. Uh, a dinosaur one to Argentina with Paul Barrett, who I know has led alumni tours in the past. And um, an astronomy and wine one with Roger Davies, which is actually our postponed trip to the solar eclipse this December, which sadly we've had to postpone. There won't be a solar eclipse, but I can give you break. So 
sorry, someone muted me. If you <laughs> if you like these webinars and would like to come to the next one or one of the next ones on the day of the total solar eclipse in Argentina, we're hoping to be live streaming it to you, which is the 14th of December at uh, 1613 GMT. Uh, it's about midday in Argentina, where sadly we won't be. Anyway, I thought you might find that amusing. And um, so on to uh, Nick and um, his Wildlife of Peru trip, uh, which is the next one we're running, um, which is uh, in May next year. And I know some of you already signed up on that trip, but we do have some spaces. It looks uh, an absolutely fantastic one. Um, that little quote I put on the screen is just from some clients who we sent to the lodge where, where the group will be staying, their last lodge in the Amazon. So you can see all the sort of things that they saw. Um, and um, um, so if anyone would like that little leaflet or any of our other leaflets, just let me know. I'll put a link in the chat later. Um, and um, so now I'm, I'm going to, in a minute, stop sharing my screen. I'm going to hand over to Nick Davies. Um, I'm delighted to introduce him. Well, I know he needs little introduction to many of you who've been on his tours. Nick has done, I think, 10 alumni tours to Latin America, uh, Costa Rica, Galapagos. He's actually got a Costa Rica trip uh, going with our fellow tour operator, Temple World, next uh, April, um, and um, uh, Madagascar and Ecuador and Galapagos. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to hand over to Nick, who is, by the way, a Professor of Behavioural Ecology at um, Cambridge, Department of Zoology, um, a Fellow of Pembroke, um, um, who do um, marvellous lunches, um, and a Fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, he's probably best known for his cuckoo um, book, which I absolutely love. Um, when I read it the other day, here we are, Cuckoo. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure he's going to fascinate us with his tales of, um, of, of Wallace, uh, Bates and Darwin. So Nick, I'm going to, and, and, and as I said before, if you have any questions for Nick, who's going to talk for probably about 25 minutes, just pop them into the chat and I will try and corral them afterwards and put them to him. Um, and apologies now if we have a bit of screen glitchiness, uh, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, then um, Nick, go ahead and um, do share yours. Okay. <clears throat> Perfect. And over to you, Nick. Thank you very much. Good. Um, well, I hope you can hear me and see me and even more importantly, see this crazy cuckoo in my first slide. A very warm welcome to everybody, wherever you are. The sun is just setting outside my home window here in Cambridge. So I've got a cup of tea. I suspect some of you might be having an early morning cup of coffee or maybe some lucky ones having an after dinner drink. But wherever you are, welcome to this um, virtual meeting. And a big thank you to Claire and Kate and Ed for organizing it and especially to Ed for being our host this evening. Well, our travels have to be imaginary ones for a little while longer. So I'd like to take you on a virtual voyage and follow the footsteps of three great naturalists, Charles Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace, and Henry Walter Bates. Their adventures and ideas from nearly 200 years ago are still inspirational for travelers today. So here's a fine sight for a curious naturalist as a cuckoo on the right being fed by a little pipit and the question we can ask is how on earth does the cuckoo get away with such outrageous trickery? And it's a puzzle I want to come to at the end of the talk. Now I've been a fanatical bird watcher ever since I was a little boy and this is my very first bird book, The Observer's Book of Birds, which I got I think when I was seven. I'm, I'm just going to close those down a bit, thank you. Um, and the two birds I most wanted to see were the tree creeper and the dipper. And I remember the exact days I saw these for the first time and there was no happier person on the planet. Well, now with the increase in knowledge, we have all 10,000 bird species in the world at our fingertips, either in 16 volumes, the handbook of the birds of the world, or download this information on your phone even. But with this increase in knowledge, somehow, 
our planet seems more vulnerable than ever. 10,000 species is all we've got. There's, nature isn't um, infinite. And no fewer than a quarter of these are now at risk, mainly because of us. Now, for most of the history of the Western world, the origin of this diversity lay firmly in the hands of the Almighty. This is Bishop Lancelot Andrews, who was master of my college, Pembroke, in Cambridge, back in the time of Shakespeare. And he was given the job of translating the book of Genesis for the King James Bible. And I often wonder if this painting captured his expression when he was told he'd got this job. Doesn't look too pleased. And here is a celebration of the fifth day of creation in some wonderful mosaics in St. Mark's in Venice. And you can see that birds and sea creatures were created on the same day. You can recognize some egrets and some ducks here and fish and strange sea monsters down below. By the time Carl Linnaeus came up with his classification system uh, in the 1700s, there was something like 6,000 animal and plant species had been described and named. So the creator had clearly been very busy. It wasn't until the following century that a changed worldview of biodiversity became plausible, and that was thanks to Charles Darwin, who came to Cambridge in 1828 as a young student at Christ College. And the streets today, even during lockdown, are a little bit busier than they were in those days. Now, by Charles's own admission, he was not a star student. He wrote in his autobiography, my time was wasted as far as academical studies were concerned. I gained a good place among the oi polloi, not for honours. And he spent a lot of his time collecting beetles. And we've got his beetle collection in the Zoology Museum here in Cambridge. So do come and have a look at it sometime. As you can see on the right, it's really magnificent. But he must have impressed his teachers, especially John Stevens Henslow, who taught him botany and geology. And it was through his good offices that Darwin was offered the post of naturalist on the voyage of the Beagle, to be captained by Robert Fitzroy, who at the age of 26 was only four years older than the young Darwin. Now, Darwin's father was a formidable doctor of 20 stones, and he had no fewer than eight objections to the Beagle voyage. And Charles, meticulous as ever, wrote them all down in his notebook, and I'll go through them. First of all, they'd be dis disrespectable to my character as a clergyman hereafter. Second, it's a wild scheme. Third, they must have offered to many others before me the place of naturalist. Fourth, and from it not being accepted, there must have been some serious objection to the vessel or expedition. Fifth, I should never settle down to a steady life hereafter. Six, my accommodation would be most uncomfortable. Seven, that you, my father, should consider it as again changing my profession. And eight, most damning of all, that it would be a useless undertaking. Well, Darwin's father eventually changed his mind and he was persuaded that the pursuit of natural history was very suitable for a young clergyman. So Darwin set forth soon after Christmas in 1831 as the Beagle set sail from Plymouth. On board, Darwin had his favorite book, which was Alexander von Humboldt's personal narrative, which had just come out a couple of years before. And Darwin wrote, nothing ever stimulated my zeal so much as Humboldt's book. I almost adore him, he wrote. And Humboldt earlier had traveled around South America, particularly exploring the links between the Orinoco and the um, Amazon rivers and he'd done some spectacular climbs up in the Andes. So for example, he climbed up on Cotopaxi and Chimborazo. Chimborazo was then thought to be the highest mountain in, in the world. And von Humboldt and his colleagues got to over 19,000 feet, fantastic. So we can imagine up there enjoying Andean condors soaring overhead the high mountain tops. And one of my favorites, this little hummingbird, the Ecuadorian hill star which goes cold at night in order to survive these high altitudes. And von Humboldt was very keen, not just collecting specimens and dumping them in museums, but describing their ecological setting. And he did these paintings of nature, the Natura Gemelda, where he was mapping species 
distribution changes as you go up a mountain, for example. Well, Darwin was not the ideal traveler and he wrote during the voyage of the Beagle, I abhor, I loathe the sea. He suffered terribly from seasickness. But they weren't at sea all the time. So here they are saving out of Plymouth. Most of the voyage, uh, most of the four years were spent around the coast of South America and Darwin was able to go ashore and collect fossils and collect specimens. So he wasn't at sea. But they'd been away for something like four years when uh, Fitzroy announced, well, let's just pop into the Galapagos and do a bit more surveying before we circumnavigate the globe to go home. And you can imagine the Beagle arriving in the waters of the Galapagos after four years busy surveying on the 15th of September, 1835. And while most of the crew set off to doing their surveying, Darwin went ashore with his colleagues and as usual, he started collecting specimens. And he writes in his diary, little birds quietly hopped about and they were not frightened by stones being thrown at them. Mr. King killed one with his hat. And here are some of his specimens, which are now on display in the Zoology Museum. So come and have a look at these next door to Darwin's beetle collection. So this one here he thought was an oriole because it's got a long beak. This one he thought was a gross beak, a finch because it's got a big thick beak. And this little one down here he thought must be a wren or a warbler. Well, he eventually returned to the UK and his first year back in the UK, he went back to Cambridge and he lived there for just one year in Fitzwilliam Street. But he wrote, the only evil I ever found in Cambridge was it being far too pleasant. It's perhaps a warning for us all there. And he then left for London to be closer to the experts who were going to identify his specimens for him. And he gave the bird specimens to an ornithologist called John Gould, who to Darwin's astonishment announced that all those little birds that he collected in the Galapagos on anatomical grounds were all finches. And the penny seemed to drop and in a famous passage in The Voyage of the Beagle, Darwin wrote, seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. And Darwin started doodling these branching evolutionary trees in his notebook. So his idea was perhaps a little flock of finches back in the distant past got blown out 600 miles across the Pacific, came across these volcanic barren islands devoid of bird life, and so had the freedom to evolve to fill various ecological niches. So species weren't immutable, they could change to take advantage of ecological opportunities in a new habitat. Well, we now actually know that Darwin's conjecture was correct. 20 years ago, the very first molecular family tree of Darwin's finches was published, and here it is. And just as Darwin imagined, all these finches with their different beak shapes are all one family. Something like two to three and a half, sorry, two to three million years ago, they originated, presumably that's this flock arriving back in the Galapagos, and diversified to fill all these different niches. So we have a set of finches which feed on seeds on the ground, big, medium and small beaks. Another set of finches which feed up in the treetops, big, uh, small and, and medium beaks again. This one's a little bit like a tit. We've got a vegetarian finch, which is essentially a parrot, and little birds with thin beaks, which are warbler finches. Now I've been on several Galapagos trips and had the privilege to see most of these little birds. And the one that has thrilled me the most is this warbler finch here, which essentially is a warbler. It's got a very thin beak for picking up little insects and it even flicks its wings to disturb the insects from the vegetation so that it can fly catch. This is a finch which is in essence over evolutionary time changed into a warbler by natural selection. And Darwin's enormous brave leap of imagination was that what goes on in this little family tree of finches serves as a model for the evolution of the whole, whole of life on earth. 
what more thrilling message could we learn that we're all part of one evolved animal family and we're just little terminal twigs on this amazing family tree. Here Darwin himself representing our own species next to chimps, our closest common ancestor up here. Now Darwin was stimulated to publish his ideas in the origin of species uh, ahead of time really by the arrival of what he called a fateful letter from Ternate in the Moluccas from another curious naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, who sent him a manuscript describing the idea of natural selection, which is exactly what Darwin uh, had come up with as his prize idea. Now, some people think that perhaps Darwin has been given unfair credit for the idea of natural selection and Wallace might have felt a bit miffed but there's nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Darwin was overjoyed to get a copy of The Origin of Species and he read it in this little hut in an island off the west of New Guinea, a year after the publication. And he wrote, Mr. Darwin has given the world a new science. His name should stand above that of every philosopher of ancient and modern times. The force of admiration can no further go. And Wallace, in fact, dedicated his book, The Malay Archipelago, to Charles Darwin. <coughs> what I love about Wallace and Darwin is not only their sense of curiosity and their bravery in their travels, but in their beautiful writing too. Wallace was bowled over by the birds of paradise and he wrote in the Malay archipelago which he dedicated to Darwin, it seems sad such exquisite creatures exhibit their charms only in wild inhospitable regions. But should civilized man ever reach these distant lands, we may be sure that he'll so disturb the nicely balanced relations of nature as to cause the extinction of these beings. This consideration must surely tell us that all living things were not made for man. Their struggles for existence would seem to be related to their own well being and perpetuation alone. Well, Wallace had previously gone on another huge trip to South America with his friend Bates. Now, unlike Darwin, who came from a very wealthy family and could pay his own way on the voyage of the Beagle, Wallace and Bates had more modest means, and these trips were to collect specimens, and the sale of these specimens was like a job for them. It was the way they earned money. And they joined together for the first part of this Amazon adventure from 1848 to 1852. So we can imagine them back to almost 200 years ago encountering the vast Amazonian rainforest and being thrilled for the very first time by the sight of the tropics. They traveled in little boats, rather like this, and they had a daily routine. They would rise at dawn and they would collect birds and mammals. And then they'd have breakfast and after breakfast, when it had warmed up a bit, they'd go out and collect insects. And then in the afternoon, when it was a bit hot, they would shelter and write their notes. And here is a beautiful example of Bates's notebook. Bates was fascinated in particular by butterflies. Well, after uh, a few years, Wallace decided to go home and his homeward trip met with disaster. The ship that he was sailing home in, the brig Helen, caught fire and poor Wallace had to spend 10 days and nights in a small rowing boat 200 miles from land before he was rescued. And we can imagine him sitting in this little rowing boat and being horrified at the sight of all his specimens and notebook going up in flames. He wrote, everything was gone. I had not one specimen to illustrate the unknown lands that I had trod. Well, luckily these specimens have been insured and on the insurance money, in the, within a year, Wallace was off to the Malay archipelago. No sign of self-pity. What a brave traveller he was. Henry Walter Bates was to stay on into the Amazon for another seven years, and he collected a total of 14,700 species, 8,000 of which were new to science. An absolutely heroic effort. And Bates too suffered enormously from the tough conditions. And he wrote in his book, The Naturalist on the River Amazons, I suffered most inconvenience from the deficiency of getting news from the civilized world, from ill health arising from bad or insufficient food, 
and I was obliged at last to come to the conclusion that the contemplation of nature alone is not sufficient to fill the human heart and mind. Now Bates was fascinated by insects and fascinated by colour and camouflage. And here on the left is one of the butterflies that particularly thrilled him, these brightly coloured heliconius butterflies. And they flew very slowly through the forests and Bates was easily able to catch them in his net and he wondered why birds didn't catch them too. And he discovered when he tasted some of these butterflies, entomologists are a very odd lot, they like to taste their captures, he discovered that these butterflies were distasteful. And so he realised immediately that birds didn't pursue them because they were distasteful, and these bright colours were warning colourations to keep birds at bay. Now, since Bates's time, we've learned of a fascinating interaction between these butterflies and the passion plants, Passiflora, on which they lay their eggs. So here are some Heliconius butterfly eggs on a passion plant. And they then hatch out and the little caterpillars eat the leaves. So this is very costly for the plant. The bigger caterpillars not only eat leaves, but they're also cannibals and they'll eat smaller caterpillars. And so butterflies tend to avoid plants where there's already eggs. And this now sets the stage for a wonderful trick evolved by the Passiflora. Namely, they've evolved these little egg mimics, these little yellow dots on their leaves to deter laying by butterflies. Now the tropics are full of incredible tricks like this. And we can enjoy these wonders ourselves now, for example, if we go to Peru. Peru is an extraordinary country. Uh, 1,861 bird species have been recorded there. That's two and a half times as many as the whole of Europe. 139 of these species are endemic. That means they occur nowhere else. And there's a record from the number of bird species seen in one day, which is 331 scored down here in the Manu National Park. <coughs> And you can sit in the forest and at first not much seems to be going on, but if you sit very quietly, eventually you start to notice extraordinary colour around you. Trogons and mot mots waiting to drop down on little frogs and lizards and insects. Beautiful toucans feeding on fruits up in the canopy. My favourite is this little hidden underworld of these little brown jobs, the leaf tossers and the tree hunters and the ant birds which follow army ant swarms. A, a radiation of hundreds of species which makes uh, Darwin's Galapagos finches very modest in their diversity. And then you're surrounded by these incredibly bright hummingbirds. There are 328 species in the Neotropics, no fewer than 117 in Peru. And I want to talk a bit about the, the hummingbird which has thrilled me the most, which is the sword-billed hummingbird, which you can find up in the cloud forests. And the beak of this bird is actually longer than its body. It's, it's so long, in fact, that when the hummingbird perches, it has to hold its beak up at an angle, otherwise it would fall off the branch. And this hummingbird, as you might imagine, feeds on plants with very long corollas. Now, this is a sort of puzzle that Wallace and Darwin would be thrilled by. How on earth does this long beak and this long corolla evolve? Perhaps it's a case of coevolution evolving together. And in fact, Darwin and Wallace both um, wondered over a similar puzzle, which is this amazing comet orchid, a specimen of which was sent to Darwin from Madagascar, which has a very long nectary this huge long nectar here, it's about a foot long here. So the nectar's down at the bottom here. And Darwin wrote, this nectar is of an astonishing length. Good heavens, what insect can suck it? There must be moths. And Wallace, who was probably a better entomologist than Darwin, knew about sphinx moths in mainland Africa. And he predicted that it was a sphinx moth. And he said, I, we can make this prediction as certainly as an astronomer could predict the occurrence of Neptune in the night sky. Well, a hundred years later, the sphinx moth surely was discovered pollinating these plants with this huge long proboscis to match this huge long nectary. 
and it was named Predictor in honor of Wallace's famous prediction. Now, how can these long proboscis and these long corollas co-evolve? <clears throat> well, we don't know in detail what's going on either in the orchid or in those uh, saw-billed hummingbirds, but experiments on a similar system has shown what's probably going on. And this is some lovely work done in South America uh, by Anton Poor on a fly which has got a very long proboscis and it feeds on nectar in these long corollid flowers. And what Anton did is he measured the nectar consumed by these flies when they visited a plant and also measured the number of pollen grains they picked up uh, close to the base of their proboscis. And what he found was that the fly does best if its tongue is longer than the tube. And you can see why, because if your tongue is longer than the tube, you can get right down to the bottom and have more nectar, which is what the fly wants. But the flower does best if the tube is longer than the tongue, because then that forces the fly to stick its face right into the base of the, the flower and so pick up more pollen grains. So each does best if it has a longer appendage than the other one, and that's the race, if you like, giving rise to ever longer tongues and ever longer tubes. And something similar must have happened, presumably, in the uh, co-evolution of the beak of the saw-billed hummingbird and its long corollid flowers. And a question that's still not solved is what causes this race to end? Why don't beaks and tubes evolve to be ever longer? There must be costs and those details have not yet been worked out. Well, there's another stunning delight up in the, <clears throat> in the, in the um, cloud forest, and that's these extraordinary birds, these Andean cocks of the rocks, as brightly colored as any bird of paradise, this stunning orange red, and I love this beautiful pale gray on these inner wing feathers here. Now in these species, uh, as in many fruit eating species, the males do nothing all day apart from prance around and display to try and get mates. It's the females who do all the work in raising the young themselves. And it's the fruit diet which really explains what's going on because fruit is rather an unusual prey, namely it's advertising itself and it wants to be eaten because that's the way the plant disperses its seed. And so with such an easily obtainable food, it's possible for females to raise the young themselves and the males are emancipated and can spend all day long displaying instead. An example of what Darwin called sexual selection, where males are competing to try and be more charming than their rivals. So they are chosen by females for mates. You can encounter another wonderful example of sexual selection in the rainforest and that is your early morning wake up call, which is the howls of howler monkeys. No chance of a lion. You'll hear these roars from up in the treetops. And in these monkeys, as in many mammals, the competition among males for mates is often not to charm females, but simply to gain them by strength, by force, if you like. And these calls are an honest demonstration of strength where males are trying to outcompete each other to fight for harems of females. And the males with the loudest calls are able to get harems. So the male's done all his work in collecting females by these displays, and he's guaranteed of his paternity and doesn't have to mate so much. But there are other species of howler monkeys which live in bigger groups where there are several males in the group. And here they can't be so sure of their paternity and so they've invested not only in calls, but in loud balls too, to enable them to copulate many times. There's a sort of sperm lottery and it increases your chance of winning paternity the more you mate. So while single male uh, groups have howler monkeys with loud calls, those in multi-male groups have calling, but also larger testes. Well, I've got time for just one more thrilling thing that we can encounter in the Neotropics, and that is the discovery there are lots of species of cuckoos. And the big surprise for those of us who are familiar with cheating cuckoos is that many of the cuckoos in the Neotropics are parental. They're just like the birds in your back garden. They build their own nests. 
and they look after their own young. They're not cheats at all. And it's very clear when you look at the family tree of cuckoos, there's something like 150 species in the world, that the parasitic cuckoos are the terminal twigs of the, e of the evolutionary tree. They've evolved from parental cuckoo ancestry. And their key trick of the parasitic cuckoos is that they lay an egg which mimics the host eggs. So parasitic cuckoos are specialists. They specialize on one particular host species and they'll lay an egg which matches their egg of the chosen host. And here's a wonderful example. These two eggs on the left are host eggs. This egg here on the right, which is virtually identical, is actually a cuckoo egg. You might think, is this uh, beauty of mimicry important for fooling the hosts? And the answer is yes, it is. Because if you put a model egg into the nest or an egg, an egg, a real egg, which is different from the host's own eggs, they quickly throw it out. So no wonder the cuckoo has had to evolve such a good match in order to fool its hosts. And in fact, hosts have not just become sharper eyed at spotting odd eggs in their nest, but their eggs have evolved too as signatures. Hosts which have been involved with an arms race against cuckoos have especially well-marked eggs in the form of spots and squiggles, where in effect they're writing on their eggs, this is my egg. And the cuckoos then have to evolve exact forgeries by writing with the same spots and squiggles, this is your egg too. And the end result is we have this wonderful signature forgery arms race. Now, another difference between neotropical uh, parasitic cuckoos and our old world cuckoos is the way the young cuckoo gets away, uh, gets rid of the, the opposition, the host young. Our cuckoos in the old world, the cuckoo chick hatches first and balances each of the host eggs on its back one by one and chucks them over the side of the nest. The neotropical cuckoos often parasitize hosts which have dome nests. So perhaps ejecting eggs would be more difficult. And instead they have a different trick is that they have these little bill hooks with which they slash the host chicks to death. And the parents will then remove the dead young. So in both cases, the cuckoo chick commandeers the nest and the poor old hosts are doomed to raising a cuckoo chick instead of a brood of their own. Well, Darwin closes his wonderful book, The Origin of Species, with a final page where he writes, there's grandeur in this view of life. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Well, Darwin died on the 19th of April, 1882 in his 70s. And just a few weeks earlier, he'd published his very last paper in the journal Nature. And this was a short paper called On the Dispersal of Freshwater Bivalves. Darwin had been sent by a correspondent through the post, a water beetle, and clamped to the leg of this water beetle was a little bivalve mollusk, a little shell. And Darwin, as ever, immediately saw the bigger picture. He realized that this might be the way that sedentary animals like shells could be transported to new habitats by hitching a ride on animals, namely beetles, which could fly. So Darwin was absolutely wonderful taking some seemingly trivial observation and realizing a bigger story. Now there's a wonderful coda to this uh, story with which I'll end the talk. And that is that the correspondent who sent this specimen was a Mr. Crick from Northampton. Mr. Crick was to have a grandson called Francis, who was also to publish a famous paper in Nature 70 years later. And this, of course, is the Crick of Watson and Crick, and the paper was the structure of DNA, which gave birth to the foundation of molecular biology, which was to provide such fantastic support for Darwin's evolutionary ideas. And with that, I'll end our voyage and thank you all very much for listening. Mick, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I can see why uh, um, um, uh, Michael Barclay, who I gather you were on Private Passions on 
on Radio 3 with a couple of years, I can see why he called you an expert in the art of deception, <laughs> because that you've given us some wonderful examples. Um, I've, I've got a few little questions, mainly, see, I think that have come in um, um, uh, beforehand, which I'm going to quickly ask you, and, but just allow you to get your breath back. There was one right at the beginning, which I'm going to ask Kate, um, which is a question that came in from someone in Hong Kong, actually. Um, and Kate, the question was um, about UK tours and the alumni travel program, and um, what, what's your current thinking on those? Yeah, it's a really good question. Actually, it's quite um, quite topical because it would have been great if we did have a few UK tours this year to have some um, trips to be able to run. So it's definitely something we are thinking about and is part of our strategy over the next few years. I'm just in the process of trying to find some suitable tour operator partners to work with, and then hopefully we'll be able to get some UK, UK trips um, in the programme. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And... Um... Fantastic. Okay, well, it's back to you, Nick. I've got a question here that came in beforehand from, from Emma Hay. She says, she says, what is your favorite favorite mutualism? What is the favorite mutualism you've seen or heard about in South America or Central America? And I can tell you for uh, Commonwealth Garden Oxford Agrix like me, uh, you'll probably have to explain what mutualism is. Okay, so mutualism is a relationship between two organisms, usually two different species. <clears throat> which is beneficial to both. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that there the, the could still be conflicts of interest. <clears throat> so like that uh, lovely example between the saw-billed hummingbird and the uh, long corollaed plants, the hummingbirds really aren't interested in pollination. They just want a nice drink of nectar. And the plants are producing nectar at a cost simply in order to get the hummingbirds to, pollen to take the pollen to another plant. So the specialization is very beneficial from the plant's point of view, because it then forces the hummingbird to fly to another plant of the same species, and that makes for efficient pollination. But there could still be conflicts, like each does better with a slightly longer appendage uh, in order to better gain its own benefits. So I love that example, just because I just love the aesthetics of looking at sword billed hummingbirds. I mean, the field guide says you can never see enough of this astonishing bird. And that's absolutely true. I think another favourite mutualism of, of mine is between leafcutter ants and the little fungi with which they uh, grow their food on the leaves. So one of the delights in the Neotropics is these little trails of leafcutter ants going across the surface of the forest, carrying their leaves into these huge nests. And the, they were the first farmers, in effect. They grow fungi on these leaves uh, and then eat the fungi. And this is a lovely mutualism because the, the ants rely on the fungi, but the fungi also rely on the ants. Uh, without the ants, they would not uh, exist. So this is a very tightly co-evolved mutualism. And there's lots of lovely other examples between fruits and birds dispersing the fruits and so on. So Darwin writes in his book about this entangled bank of interactions. And I think the term entangled bank explains beautifully these mutualisms and co-evolution where each species almost gives a, a niche for other species to come and live with or to exploit it. Yeah, fantastic, Nick. Um, another question actually also from Emma. Um, she says, are there many biodiverse hotspots left in South and Central America that humans haven't touched? I mean, I, I, I know one of them is the one that you're going to be visiting in Peru, but... Um... This is Tambo Pata. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yes, there are hotspots which are untouched by humans in the sense that loggers haven't got there yet. For example, up in the cloud forests, uh, the, the wood is harder to get that in, than in lowland forests. But it doesn't mean to say they're untouched by humans because these habitats, although humans haven't yet gone there to destroy them by hand, they're still suffering the effects of climate change, for example, indirect effects of human activities. And I've got colleagues who are documenting uh, change in, in distributions of plants and, and birds uh, moving up the mountain with global warming, changes in distributions up the Andes, very rapid changes in distributions and, and results of climate change. And of course, even if you go to remote islands or to Antarctica, there's still signs of pollution and climate change there. So I think no, no habitats unaffected by man 
even those which seem to have escaped our direct attentions. Yeah, and on the same similar topic, um, Dennis Richards asked, what's the best measure of biodiversity? If okay, you can do that one. That's, that's, a really good, <laughs> so that's a very good question. I think there isn't one, one measure. So you might think, well, it's just counting the number of species would give you a measure of biodiversity. But actually that's not satisfactory on its own because it could be that some of those species are incredibly rare. So you might want some measure of evenness of distribution of, 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 of the biodiversity. And then you might be interested in even habitats with rather little biodiversity if those habitats are special and those species don't exist anywhere else on earth. So your biodiversity measure might want to take account of other places where you've measured biodiversity too. So I think the bottom line is you can't just come up with a number. Um, you have to think a bit more carefully about about all the interactions and the scale of measurement? That's a good question. Uh, I've got one, this is the penultimate one of the ones from beforehand. Um, does tourism have more of a negative than a positive impact on, I guess, on um, biodiversity? Um, mm -hmm. And so I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say on that. I know I was listening to a fascinating talk from the mm -hmm. Gladys Conservation Trust just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll put a link to it in the chat uh, mm. because that was certainly covered. But mm. fascinating on your views on it, Nick. That's a that's a very good question, and and I really thought that the little quote I read from Wallace's Malay Archipelago about wondering <coughs> what would happen if if um, man ever got to these remote places where the birds of paradise existed. He he surely predicted they would go extinct, and there's some terrible things happening in New Guinea now, which, where Wallace's predictions are coming true lots of deforestation in order to, to build um, oil palms and lots of limestone being taken for um, buildings um, in, in China especially. So sadly, Wallace's predictions are true. And also in the Galapagos, which you might think is a pristine habitat, um, tourists of course bring enormous benefits to the Galapagos in terms of bringing in money uh, to help run the parks. But the infrastructure to support the tourists um, is causing damage, there's no doubt. Introduction of pests which come through on the food to feed the tourists. So there's a fly has come in in the last a few decades. And this is a fly which feeds on the blood of little birds and kills them. And some of the Darwin's finches are literally being eaten to death as nestlings and are in danger of extinction. So tourism is a double-edged sword. You might think, well, we can solve biodiversity problems by making it more profitable for the locals to keep um, a biodiversity and make money from tourists rather than have a short-term gain from getting the resources now. But the influx of tourists, no doubt, <coughs> causes problems too. And it's a very difficult and delicate balancing act. Um, Ed, you're going to say something about the Galapagos. You uh, yeah, no, I put a link in the chat. It's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. I highly recommend everyone watch it. Uh, scientists were put, uh, in the middle of, of their lockdown, just uh, explaining what the situation was. And I absolutely agree with you, Nick. It's, it's a balance, isn't it? But I think in the case of the Galapagos, most people would consider that the benefit of tourism, yes. but it does win out. Um, and I, I want to ask you a totally uh, uh, non-contentious question now. Um, do Latin American cuckoos migrate? Oh, um, I'm, I'm actually, I should know the answer to that. And I, I don't know. And most, most tropical birds are pretty sedentary. They might move up and down a mountain, for example, or have short movements. But my guess is most of the, most of the uh, tropical cuckoos, like that squirrel cuckoo I showed, um, will, will be residents and defend an, uh, a territory throughout the year. But to be honest, I don't know exactly. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, I now, I've seen there's a question about the coronavirus, which I suppose was, uh, <laughs> is not unlikely. Um, um, Nigel's asked, with COVID-19, do you expect the May trip to Peru to go ahead? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my view very quickly on that because obviously it's, it's a quick changing situation. Um, I know we've had a bit of news on vaccine yesterday and today, but it seems to me it's only a trial and it's not got to the end of it quite yet. Personally, I'm optimistic. Um, I was actually, Nick and I were talking about this the other day. I am optimistic. Peru opened up um, um, a, a couple of weeks ago. They're gradually opening up. Their strategy is 
four hour flights, eight hour flights. And so we're not allowed in, but we will be by May for sure. Um, and there'll be socially distanced measures and things like that. Uh, there are some practical problems with travel insurance, but um, I did write to the Foreign Secretary today all about that. So I'm trying to get the Foreign Office to change their view. So I think um, the answer is cautious um, optimism. And actually what we're saying to give people who might be consider booking uh, uh, maximum flexibility is that at least until we're up to the uh, minimum numbers and we're not quite yet, then uh, if you book and pay a deposit, you can pull out whenever you want. So that's the reassurance I can give there. Um, and now, Nick, I've got another question for you, which I, which I think is a really nice one. Um, Rowena Rothery asked, um, I wonder if you could offer any insight upon how we inspire a younger generation to experience the joys of wildlife, especially in less biodiverse areas. Oh, that's a great question. I think my answer is that we're all born curious naturalists. Those of us who've got children or grandchildren can see just the pure delight that young children have in exploring nature, discovering little insects and, and seeing new birds and so on. And I think the trick is to somehow nurture that uh, by changing um, the curriculum in schools. And I think it's a great shame, for example, we don't have um, um, courses in, in natural history, <clears throat> or we don't have what I suppose I could call just natural history literacy. We teach our children to read and write, but very rarely do we teach them the names of common birds and common plants. And, and to have this on the curriculum where you, you'd learn the names of the 20 trees in your local area, the common wild plants, all the birds that you're likely to see in your back garden. That nature literacy, I think, would then give you the springboard to ha have a greater interest. And certainly evolutionary biology, I I'd love to see that more in um, GCSE and A-level courses. Um, it seems, I'm repeating myself, but it really seems to me the most thrilling thing that you can learn as a kid is that we're all part of one evolved animal family on earth. And that's just going to affect your interest and, and your um, values, I think, for the rest of your life. Now, there's a second part to the question is how can you do it then when most of us live in cities away from wildlife? And I think even, even in cities, there are parks where there's stuff going on. I mean, where, wherever you are, there are ants, for example, and ants are absolutely fascinating. If you get on your hands and knees and rubble around in the undergrowth and watch what ants are doing, a whole new world is up and out. And get your children to put out little Petri dishes or little pots with sugar solution and watch where the ants come to, whether they choose stronger or weaker liquids and where they go with their, with their food and look at their little interactions and look at their traffic lanes they form naturally as they scurry about in the undergrowth. Just these little hidden worlds, I think, can be absolutely thrilling too. Thank you so much, Nick. Sorry, I had to mute myself. I think my telephone went. Um, <laughs> I think that's a wonderful point on, on which to draw proceedings to a close. I know I said uh, we were only going to be 45 minutes. We've already been talking for nearly an hour. It's been absolutely fascinating. I know I join with everyone in, in, in thanking you so much for really an inspirational and, and, and very educational talk. And maybe I will ask everyone to unmute themselves and just show their appreciation. And Nick Davies, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.